GoldenEye 007 is a first-person shooter video game developed by Rare and based on the 1995 James Bond film GoldenEye. It was released for the Nintendo 64 video game console in August 1997. The game features a single-player campaign in which players assume the role of British Secret Intelligence Service agent James Bond as he fights to prevent a criminal syndicate from using a satellite weapon against London to cause a global financial meltdown. The game includes a split-screen multiplayer mode in which up to four players can compete in different types of deathmatch games. GoldenEye 007 was developed over a period of two and a half years by an inexperienced team led by Martin Hollis, who had previously worked on the coin-op version of Killer Instinct. It was partially conceived as an on-rails shooter inspired by Sega's Virtua Cop, before being redesigned as a free-roaming shooter. The game was highly acclaimed by the gaming media and sold over 8 million copies worldwide, making it the third best-selling Nintendo 64 game. It received the BAFTA Interactive Entertainment Games Award and four awards from the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences. Retrospectively, GoldenEye 007 is considered an important game in the history of first-person shooters for demonstrating the viability of game consoles as platforms for the genre, and for signaling a transition from the then-standard Doom-like approach to a more realistic style. It pioneered features such as atmospheric single-player missions, stealth elements, and a console multiplayer deathmatch mode. The game is frequently cited as one of the greatest video games of all time. A spiritual successor, Perfect Dark, was released in 2000, while a reimagining of the game, also titled GoldenEye 007, was released in 2010. Topic: Gameplay. GoldenEye 007 is a first-person shooter that features both single and multiplayer modes. In the single-player mode, the player takes the role of James Bond through a series of free-roaming 3D levels. Each level requires the player to complete a certain set of objectives—such as collecting or destroying specified items, rescuing hostages, or meeting with friendly non-player characters—and then exit the stage. Some gadgets from the James Bond film series are featured in the game and are often used to complete mission objectives, for example, in one level, the electromagnetic watch from Live and Let Die is used to acquire a jail cell key, the arsenal of weapons includes pistols, submachine guns, assault rifles, grenades, and throwing knives, among others. Guns have a finite magazine and must be reloaded after a certain number of shots, but the player may acquire and carry as many weapons as can be found in each mission. The player's initial weapon in most missions is the Walther PPK, called the PP-7 Special Issue in-game. Most of the game's firearms are modeled on real-life counterparts although their names are altered, while others are based on fictitious devices featured in the James Bond films, such as the Golden Gun and Moonraker Laser. The weapons vary in characteristics such as rate of fire, degree of penetration, and type of ammunition used, and inflict different levels of damage depending on which body part they hit. Stealth is a significant element of the gameplay. Frequent gunfire can alert distant guards, and activated alarms can trigger infinitely respawning enemies. Therefore, to avoid gunfights with numerous opponents, it is advantageous to eliminate soldiers and security cameras before they spot or hear the player. Certain weapons incorporate suppressor or telescopic sight attachments to aid the player in killing enemies discreetly. There are no health recovery items in the game, although armor vests can be acquired to provide a secondary health bar. Four save files are available to track the player's progress through the game's 20 missions, each of which may be played on Agent, Secret Agent, or OO Agent difficulty settings. Higher difficulties increase the challenge by altering factors such as the damage enemies can withstand and inflict, the amount of ammunition available, and the number of objectives that must be completed. Once a mission is completed, the player may either continue progressing through the story or choose to replay a previously completed level. Completing certain missions within particular target times enables the player to unlock bonus cheat options which make various changes to the gameplay. Upon fully completing the game on the hardest difficulty setting, an additional 007 mode is unlocked, allowing the player to customize the challenge of any mission by manually adjusting enemies' health, reaction times, aiming accuracy, and the damage they inflict. The multiplayer mode allows two, three, or four players to compete against each other in five different types of split-screen deathmatch games: Normal, You Only Live Twice, The Living Daylights, Flag Tag, The Man with the Golden Gun, and License to Kill. 
Normal is a basic deathmatch mode in which the main objective is to kill opponents as many times as possible. It can be played as a free for all game or in teams. In You Only Live Twice, players only have two lives before they are eliminated from the game, while License to Kill is a mode in which players die from a single hit with any weapon. In The Man with the Golden Gun, a single golden gun, which is capable of killing opponents with only one shot, is placed in a fixed location on the map. Once the golden gun is picked up, the only way to reacquire it is to kill the player holding it. The player with the golden gun is unable to pick up body armor while opponents can. In The Living Daylights, a flag is placed in a fixed location on the map, and the player who holds it the longest wins. The flag carrier cannot use weapons but can still collect them to keep opponents from stocking ammunition. Aspects of each game type can be customized, including the chosen map, class of weapons, and winning condition. As players progress through the single-player mode, new maps and characters are unlocked in the multiplayer mode. Topic. Plot GoldenEye 007 starts in Arkhangelsk in the Soviet Union in 1986, where MI6 has uncovered a secret chemical weapons facility at the Bialomori Dam. James Bond and fellow OO agent Alec Trevelyan are sent to infiltrate the facility and plant explosive charges. During the mission, Trevelyan is killed by Colonel Arkady Aramov, while Bond escapes by commandeering an aeroplane. Five years later in 1991, Bond is sent to investigate a satellite control station in Severnaya, Russia, where programmer Boris Grishenko works. Two years after the Severnaya mission, Bond investigates an unscheduled test firing of a missile in Kyrgyzstan, believed to be a cover for the launch of a satellite known as GoldenEye. This space-based weapon works by firing a concentrated electromagnetic pulse at any Earth target to disable any electrical circuit within range. As Bond leaves the silo, he is ambushed by Aramov and a squad of Russian troops. Aramov manages to escape during the encounter. The remainder of the game takes place in 1995. Bond visits Monte Carlo to investigate the frigate Lafayette, where he rescues several hostages and plants a tracker bug on the pirate helicopter before it is stolen by the Janus crime syndicate. Bond is then sent a second time to Severnaya, but during the mission he is captured and locked up in the bunker's cells along with Natalia Simonova, a captive computer programmer unwilling to work with Janus. The two escape the complex seconds before it is destroyed, on the orders of Aramov, by the GoldenEye satellite's EMP. Bond next travels to St. Petersburg, where he arranges with ex-KGB agent Valentin Zhukovsky to meet the chief of the Janus organization. This is revealed to be Alec Trevelyan, his execution by Aramov in the Arkhangelsk facility was faked. Bond and Natalia escape from Trevelyan, but are arrested by the Russian police and taken to the military archives for interrogation. Bond eventually manages to escape the interrogation room, rescue Natalia, and communicate with Defense Minister Dmitry Mishkin, who has verified Bond's claim of Aramov's treachery. Natalia is recaptured by General Aramov, and Bond gives chase through the streets of St. Petersburg, eventually reaching an arms depot used by Janus. There, Bond destroys its weaponry stores and then hitches a ride on Trevelyan's ex-Soviet missile train, where he kills Aramov and rescues Natalia. However, Alec Trevelyan and his ally Xenia Anatop escape to their secret base in Cuba. Natalia accompanies Bond to the Caribbean. Surveying the Cuban jungle aerially, their light aircraft is shot down. Unscathed, Bond and Natalia perform a ground search of the area's heavily guarded jungle terrain, but are ambushed by Xenia, who is quickly killed by Bond. Bond sneaks Natalia into the control center to disrupt transmissions to the GoldenEye satellite and force it to burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. He then follows the fleeing Trevelyan through a series of flooded caverns, eventually arriving at the antenna of the control center's radio telescope. Trevelyan attempts to realign it in a final attempt to restore contact with the GoldenEye, but Bond ultimately destroys machinery vital to controlling the antenna and defeats Trevelyan in a gunfight on a platform above the dish. <laughs> <laughs> development <laughs> Design GoldenEye 007 was developed by Rare and directed by Martin Hollis, who had previously worked as a second programmer on the coin-op version of Killer Instinct. 
In November 1994, after Nintendo and Rare discussed the possibility of developing a game based on the then future James Bond film Goldeneye, Hollis told Tim Stamper, Rare's managing director, that he was interested in the project. Due to the success of Rare's 1994 title Donkey Kong Country, Goldeneye 007 was originally suggested as a 2D side scrolling platformer for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. However, Hollis proposed a 3D shooting game. For the Nintendo 64 console, then still in development and known as Ultra 64, he then created a document with all the design ideas he wanted in the game, including gadgets, weapons, characters to use, story digression from the film, and an artificial intelligence AI that would react to the player's actions. Sega's 1994 light gun shooter Virtua Cop was the primary influence on the game, although id Software's seminal 1993 first-person shooter Doom and the Nintendo 64 launch title Super Mario 64 were also credited. Features such as gun reloading, position-dependent hit reaction animations, penalties for killing innocent characters, and the game's manual aiming system that is activated upon pressing the R button of the Nintendo 64 controller were adopted from Virtua Cop. At one point, developers planned to implement the reloading of the weapons by the player unplugging and reinserting the rumble pock on the controller, but the idea was ultimately discarded at Nintendo's behest. The concept of several varied objectives within each mission was inspired by the multiple tasks in each stage of Super Mario 64. The team in charge of the project visited the studios of the GoldenEye film several times to collect photographs and blueprints of the sets that were used. Eon Productions and MGM, the companies that control the rights of the James Bond films, granted the team a broad license, and many levels in the game were extended or modified to allow the player to participate in sequences which the film's James Bond did not. Although the reference material was used for authenticity, the team was not afraid to add to it to help the game design. John Woo films such as Hard Boiled were significant influences on the game's visual effects and kinetic moments. Details such as bullet marks on walls, cartridge cases being ejected from guns, and objects exploding were part of the design. Hollis explained that he wanted players to receive a lot of feedback from the environment when they shoot. Topic. Production Work on GoldenEye 007 began in January 1995 with a team of three people that was hired by Hollis, programmer Mark Edmonds, background artist Carl Hilton, and character artist B. Jones. Edmonds focused on creating a game engine that could render 3D graphics from art packages into Nintendo 64 data structures. Hilton modeled levels based on the film material, while Jones constructed characters based on photos and costumes they had. Since final Nintendo 64 specifications and development kits were not initially available to Rare, the team had to estimate the finalized console's capabilities using an SGI Onyx workstation and Nintendo's custom Ninja development software. In the following months, designer Duncan Botwood joined the team to construct the levels. The first year was spent producing art assets and developing the engine, which originally only allowed the player and enemies to move around a virtual environment. Originally, the development team considered the possibility for the game to have both on rails and free roaming modes because they did not know how the Nintendo 64 controller would be. GoldenEye's gas plant location was modeled by Hilton with a predetermined path in mind. A modified Sega Saturn controller was used for some early playtesting. The designer's initial priority was purely on the creation of interesting spaces, level design and balance considerations such as the placement of start and exit points, characters and objectives did not begin until this process was complete. According to Hollis, the benefit of this sloppy unplanned approach was that many of the levels in the game have a realistic and nonlinear feel. There are rooms with no direct relevance to the level. There are multiple routes across the level. After the first year of development, Rare decided to add more staff to the project. The first edition was designer David Doak, who helped with the level designs and worked on the game's AI scripting. He explained how the game's stealth elements were implemented. Whenever you fired a gun, it had a radius test and alerted the non-player characters within that radius. If you fired the same gun again within a certain amount of time, it did a larger radius test and I think there was a third even larger radius after that. It meant if you found one guy and shot him in the head and then didn't fire again, the timer would reset. 
Windows throughout the game were programmed so that enemies cannot see through them while the player can. Though decidedly unrealistic, this was an intentional feature made to encourage the player to use Windows to covertly spy on enemies. A second programmer, Steve Ellis, was hired by Hollis six months later. Although Ellis assisted the development team in many areas and programmed the cheat options, he was mostly responsible for implementing the game's multiplayer mode, which was added to the game roughly six months before it was released. According to Doak, Ellis sat in a room with all the code written for a single-player game and turned GoldenEye into a multiplayer game." The team spent numerous late evenings playtesting it before it was finished. The multiplayer levels are based on single-player missions and some of them do not support four players because they were initially not designed to handle multiplayer action. Adrian Smith, the game's third and last artist, who had already worked on some games at Rare, was in charge of producing visual effects such as muzzle flashes and explosions. He mentioned the 1995 film Heat as an influence. A firing range was modeled as an environment, but was ultimately not added to the game. The final Nintendo 64 hardware could render polygons faster than the SGI Onyx workstation the development team had been using. This helped the developers significantly, as some backgrounds rendered at two frames per second on the Onyx without even drawing enemies, objects, or Bond's gun. However, the game's textures had to be cut down by half. Hilton explained one method of improving the game's performance. A lot of GoldenEye is in black and white. RGB color textures cost a lot more in terms of processing power. You could do double the resolution if you used grayscale, so a lot was done like that. If I needed a bit of color, I'd add it in the vertex." When Super Mario 64 was released in 1996, the 3D collision detection system of the game was very influential for Hollis because GoldenEye 007 was using a 2D method. The music of GoldenEye 007 was primarily composed by Graham Norgate and Grant Kirkhope. Norgate previously penned the music of Blast Corps, while Kirkhope composed the music of Donkey Kong Land 2. Robin Beanland, the game's third composer, only wrote the elevator music that can be heard in certain levels. All the sound effects were created by Norgate and a lot of effort was put into combining and permuting sounds in different ways to give the game a satisfying feel. According to Hollis, whenever the player shoots a gun in the game, up to nine different sound effects will randomly trigger. When the game was reviewed by Nintendo shortly before it was released, the company was slightly concerned about the amount of violence and gunplay. As a result, the team toned down the killing and added an end credits sequence that introduces all the non-player characters, giving the game a filmic sense. The game ultimately received a teen rating from the Entertainment Software Rating Board. GoldenEye 007 was released on a 96 megabit cartridge on the 25th of August 1997. Every cartridge of the game contains a fully functional ZX Spectrum emulator with 10 rare developed games. This function was originally made as an experimental side project by Rare and was deactivated in the final build of the game, but has since been unlocked through fan-made patches. The actual development of GoldenEye 007 took more than two and a half years to complete and a total of $2 million was spent on the game. Most of the development team, which was composed of 11 people including Hollis, was inexperienced and had never worked on a video game. As Doak recalled in 2004, Looking back, there are things I'd be wary of attempting now, but as none of the people working on the code, graphics, and game design had worked on a game before, there was this joyful naivete. Hollis considered the team very talented and dedicated, with some people working 80 hours a week and occasionally 120 hours a week. Topic reception Despite low expectations among the gaming media and an unsuccessful showing at the Electronic Entertainment Expo in Atlanta in 1997, GoldenEye 007 turned out to be both a critical and a commercial success. In 1998, it sold approximately 2.1 million units copies, surpassing The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, which was released in November 1998 and sold nearly the same amount. Overall, GoldenEye 007 sold more than 8 million units worldwide, making it the third best-selling Nintendo 64 game, behind Super Mario 64 and Mario Kart 64. 
According to a paper published on the website of the Entertainment Software Association, the game grossed $250 million worldwide. Graphically, GoldenEye 007 was praised for its varied and detailed environments, realistic animations, special effects such as glass transparencies and lingering smoke, and high frame rate in multiplayer games. The zoomable sniper rifle was praised as one of the game's most impressive and entertaining features, with Edge describing it as a novel twist and Jeff Gerstmann of GameSpot noting its ability to alleviate the game's distance fog. The game's music was praised for its inclusion of the James Bond theme and for adding ambience to the game. Some levels begin in lifts and feature transitions from elevator music to full soundtracks, which Gerstmann cited as an illustration of the game's attention to detail. However, the omission of character speech was criticized, the gameplay was highlighted for its depth. IGN's Doug Perry called GoldenEye 007 an immersive game which blends smart strategy gameplay with fast action gunmanship. Similarly, Greg Seward of Gaming Age remarked that players have a bit of freedom as to what they want to do in any given situation, and what order the directives are completed in. Reviewers also enjoyed the wide variety of weapons and the multi-objective based missions, stating that they make the game stay fresh by never having you do the same thing twice. The controls were praised for being more intuitive than Acclaim's earlier well-received Nintendo 64 first-person shooter Turok, Dinosaur Hunter. Game Revolution credited the gameplay for being realistic and different from other shooters, but also criticized the campaign for being badly paced. The publication noted that GoldenEye 007 takes it for granted that you have already seen the movie and that players may get stuck due to the game's lack of orientation. At the time, the multiplayer mode was considered the best multiplayer game on the system, edging Mario Kart 64 by a hair, according to IGN. Edge called it addictive and praised the originality of some of the scenarios such as You Only Live Twice. GoldenEye 007 received multiple year-end awards, including the BAFTA Interactive Entertainment Games Award in 1998, and four awards from the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, Console Action Game of the Year, Console Game of the Year, Interactive Title of the Year, and Outstanding Achievement in Software Engineering. Rare was also recognized for its work on the game and won the BAFTA award for Best UK Developer. <laughs> Legacy Retrospective <laughs> 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 acclaim GoldenEye 007 is frequently cited as one of the greatest video games of all time. In 2007, GamePro, placing it ninth in the 52 most important video games of all time, called it the console killer app of the 1990s and the best game ever licensed from a film. Similarly, Rowan Kaiser of 1UP.com, who placed the game 53rd on the 60 most influential games of all time, pointed out that the game paved the way for the later popularity of Halo, Call of Duty, and more. In 2011, IGN journalists placed the multiplayer mode at 17th in their list of the top 100 video game moments. And in 2010 Nintendo Power listed GoldenEye 007 as one of the greatest multiplayer experiences in Nintendo history, stating that it is remembered as one of the finest examples of a first-person shooter. In a 2000 poll, readers of computer and video games voted GoldenEye 007 into first place in a list of the 100 greatest video games, and it was ranked fifth in a poll the following year. In 2001, the game ranked 16th in Game Informer's list of the Top 100 Games of All Time. In 2004, readers of Retro Gamer voted GoldenEye as the 33rd top retro game, with the editors calling it, the game that sold a million N64s, and easily the best Bond game to date. In 2005, IGN editors ranked the game 29th in their list of top 100 games of all time, while IGN readers placed it at 7th on a similar list. Edge has featured GoldenEye 007 prominently in three greatest game lists. It placed third in a staff voted poll in 2000, 17th in a staff, reader, and gaming industry voted poll in 2007, and it was also included as one of the publication's top 10 shooters in 2003. Retrospective commentary on GoldenEye 007 in the years following its release included an October 2011 review by Mark Reese from Nintendo Life. 
Reese gave the game a rating of 8 out of 10, commenting that although the game's multiplayer mode stands up well, its graphics, audio and fiddly aiming system are dated. He noted that GoldenEye 07's approach to difficulty settings provides considerable replay value, but is a system rarely used in modern first-person shooters. On the game's original release, Edge awarded it a score of 9 out of 10, but in 2013, with the benefit of hindsight, the magazine concluded that it should have received its highest score. In 2011, the game was selected as one of 80 titles from the past 40 years to be placed in the Art of Video Games exhibit in the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Topic. Influence Video game journalists have praised GoldenEye 007 for proving that it is possible to create a fun first person shooter experience on a console in both single player and multiplayer modes. When the game was released, the first person shooter was primarily a genre for PC gamers. Journalists noted that the game opened the genre to a completely new market and that it was the first big console first -person shooter that truly got it right." The game has subsequently become credited alongside Shiny Entertainment's MDK for pioneering and popularizing the now standard inclusion of scoped sniper rifles in video games. The game's use of context-sensitive hit locations on enemies added a realism that was previously unseen in video games, though the Quake computer mod Team Fortress already featured locational damage like headshots, GoldenEye 007 introduced stealth elements not seen in previous first-person shooter games. The game's use of realistic gameplay, which contrasted with the approaches taken by Doom clones, and introduction of multiplayer deathmatch on a console are often credited for having revolutionized the genre. Edge stated that GoldenEye 007 set the standard for multiplayer console combat until it was surpassed by the release of Halo, Combat Evolved in 2001. With its 8 million copies sold, GoldenEye 007 was also one of the most significant titles that helped the Nintendo 64 to remain competitive with rival Sony's PlayStation, even though the console ultimately lost much of its market share. Topic. Successors After GoldenEye 007 was released, Rare began development of a spiritual successor titled Perfect Dark. Using an upgraded version of the GoldenEye 007 game engine, Perfect Dark was released in 2000 for the Nintendo 64. Although the game features a setting and storyline unrelated to James Bond, it shares many gameplay features, including a similar control scheme, mission objectives that vary with the difficulty setting, and cheat options unlockable through quick level completions. While Perfect Dark was still in development, Martin Hollis left Rare to work as a consultant on the development of the GameCube at Nintendo of America. Other members of the GoldenEye 007 team also left Rare to form Free Radical Design. The company would develop the Timesplitters series of first-person shooters. These games contain several references to GoldenEye 007, including the design of the Health HUD, the nature of the aiming system, and the Russian Dam setting of the opening level of Timesplitters 2. After forming a partnership with MGM in late 1998, Electronic Arts published games based upon the then recent James Bond films, Tomorrow Never Dies and The World Is Not Enough, as well as entirely original ones, including Agent Under Fire, Nightfire, Everything or Nothing, and GoldenEye, Rogue Agent. Although some of them received favorable reviews from critics, none was as critically and commercially successful as GoldenEye 007. In 2006, the James Bond game license was acquired by Activision. The company would then publish additional games, including Quantum of Solace, Bloodstone, and a 2010 reimagining of the Nintendo 64 game, also titled GoldenEye 007. The reimagining features Daniel Craig as the playable character, contemporary first-person shooter conventions, entirely new level layouts, and an online component. An Xbox Live Arcade port of GoldenEye 007 was in development at Rare for several months, with Nintendo of America president Reggie Fils Aimé stating in 2006 that Nintendo was exploring all the rights issues involved in bringing GoldenEye 007 to the Wii Virtual Console. However, due to legal issues involving the numerous license holders with rights to the game and to the Bond intellectual property, the game was not released on either format. In 2010, an independent development team released GoldenEye, Source, a multiplayer-only total conversion mod developed using Valve's Source engine. 